Okay. So welcome everybody. As I've been saying, we've having a few technical issues this evening, but hopefully it will go smoothly from here on in. So my name is Elizabeth Ann. I'm one of the textile group committee members. And um, I'm just going to run through the housekeeping, which I'm sure everybody is aware of. We'll just go through that. So obviously you can use the chat function in order to um, chat with each other, send messages, tell us where you're watching from. And if you've actually got questions for the presenters, please use the Q&A function. It's just a lot easier to keep track of questions and make sure that they're getting answered. So please, please use that. And then in terms of just some general webinar tips, you know, you can fit it to the window um, using your viewing options and uh, hopefully that'll make it an easier experience for you to watch. And then after this, we are going to have our vir virtual pub, The Needle and Thread. So that's between 8 and 9 p.m. And that's an actual uh, meeting. It's not a webinar. So it means that everybody can pop up in a box and you can all chat with each other. So we really encourage you to come and have a chat. And if we're a large group, we'll go into separate rooms. So, you know, so you'll get a chance to talk to people. So there is a separate login for that. If you go to the ICON website, and just register for that, you'll get a Zoom login if you haven't got that already. So that will be directly after the talk this evening. So I'm going to hand over to our new chair, Ksenia Marco, and she's going to host the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth Ann. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I can't s suddenly see myself, so I'm, I'm not sure what's happening. Um, we can hear you. Oh, you can, thank you. I, <laughs> I seem to have disappeared entirely. <laughs> you haven't for us, don't worry. <laughs> so anyway, this, this, this event is a chance to gain an insight into what it's like to run a conservation business from the highs to the lows, the achievements and challenges. And during this hour-long uh, webinar, two freelance conservators will discuss and compare experiences of working in the private sector, offering hints and tips along the way. So let me introduce them. We have Sarah Glenn, ACR. Sarah has been a textile conservator for over 13 years, having gained her MA Textile Conservation from the University of Southampton in 2008. And after spending just over 10 years working in the textile conservation department at the VNA, she left the museum to become a freelance textile conservator operating under the name Atelier 9. Sarah works for a wide variety of clients, including national and international museums and galleries, archives, collectors, dealers and auction houses, as well as with other conservation studios. So Sarah has acted as a consultant to a variety of costume and accessory collections. She is an ICON PACR assessor, has served on the ICON Textile Group Committee and was a member of the ICON Triennial 2019 Programme Committee. Currently, she serves as a member of ICON's Policy Advisory Panel. And then we have Zenzi Tinker, ACR. After graduating in the early 1980s with a degree in the history of design, specialising in textiles and dress, Zenzi undertook an apprenticeship in textile and tapestry conservation between 1986 and 91, uh, working in my own freelance studio in London. And then she was awarded a certificate in textile conservation in 1991 by the Museums Association and is a Trevor Walden Prize winner. Zenzi then spent the next decade working in museums, first as costume conservator at the Museum of London, and then as a senior textile conservator at the v and In 2003, Zenzi set up freelance working from home and soon established her own studio, Zenzi Tinker Conservation Limited in Brighton. So still going strong, almost two decades later, Zenzi leads an experienced team of textile and paper conservators. The team have been responsible for conserving the Royal Funeral Effigies at Westminster Abbey, the Theatrical Dress Collection at Small Hythe Place, and other textiles for um, an, a range of National Trust properties. 
Zenzi is advisor of the Legal Dress Collection at the Royal Courts of Justice and has taught workshops both here and abroad on the use of adhesives. Her team are currently developing a programme of makers workshops inspired by historic textiles. Well, welcome Sarah and Zenzi. And I do apologise for our um, uh, hiccups just now. And thank you for agreeing to chat with us this evening. As we all know, the last 18 months have been difficult for many small businesses, including freelance conservators. Alison Lister has kindly shared her own experience, both through her article in Icon News and at the AGM. And hearing about your own endeavours will also be of great interest to many of us. You've both worked in institutions and now as freelance conservators, can you tell us why and how you made that change, that move? Senzi, perhaps I could ask you to begin. Um, well, really, it was um, necessitated by a family move. We um, moved with um, our children from London to Brighton, principally to get access to better schools. And uh, I knew straight away that I wasn't going to be able to be a mother and commute on a regular basis back into London. Um, so I compacted my hours um, initially and tried that, but it, it didn't really work for me. So I decided the only option really was to set up um, working from home, which I, I did just from our spare bedroom. And then quite quickly, um, I got offered quite a lot of work and I needed a bit more space and it seemed sensible to take on a studio, which I did. Um, so it wasn't really, it wasn't exactly planned. Um, and that it's just evolved from then. And I, I think my business has just evolved responding to the work that we've been offered, basically. And Sarah, what about you? Why did you make that change? Um, I think I've always harboured uh, a desire since I've before I became a conservator, even to had to run my own business at some point, I didn't know exactly in what. And uh, I think I felt like it was just sort of the na n uh, the next natural step for me. You know, I'd done ten years at the VMA and had become a senior conservator and gained a lot more experience that way. So it just felt like a kind of natural step, and uh, just uh, wanted a, a new challenge really. Um, but like very much like Zenzi, I feel like it's it's very much evolved. So I didn't kind of jump straight into it. I kind of went part time at the museum and gradually kind of built up the work just to see if there was even a market for me. Um, mm. And so I have spent the last uh, three years or since I last uh, left the museum working from home like Zenzi and then mm -hmm. I've only just recently acquired my studio space uh, about two months ago so oh. that's a kind of new step for me. So Zenzi you work with a team of people as, you, as your business evolved you, you obviously had enough work to ask for help from others and you've gradually grown your team well, Sarah, you've chosen to work alone, I think, um, most of the time. Um, so what are the factors that led you both to make that decision? Because you both work quite differently in that way. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, it's not particularly uh, um, a, a conscious choice, as it were. It's just the way that my, again, the business has evolved. So it's not uh, something that I would say never to it's just it's sort of easier for me at the moment in terms of uh, a business plan to kind of build up business in terms of the financials and just seeing establishing myself uh, within the marketplace I suppose so um, I do quite enjoy working for myself <laughs> so it's not particularly uh, a, a bad thing at the moment and I do have um, you know when I have projects bigger projects that I need help on I do employ people on a short short term basis so uh, is, that, is that students or other um other um, graduates or anyone who's sort of uh around and available and willing uh yeah <laughs> and Zenzi did your team evolve because of the of the work 
or was this a conscious decision that you made that you didn't like working alone or you, you preferred uh, to work with I others? Know. I'm, I'm just, it's such a long time ago. I didn't mind working on my own. I didn't feel very professional working from home, um, partly because I had kids and um, animals <laughs> in the house and I had a slight near miss with a cat once. Um, and I used to keep my studio locked at all times and the cat got in and um, I came back through and the cat was curled up asleep on top of an object on a frame. <laughs> Luckily it was covered in tissue and Tyvek but it, it kind of just freaked me out a bit. <laughs> um, and then I think as soon as, I think the thing was for me that the objects I was getting asked to do were actually a little too big for my, for my bedroom space mm -hmm. and I did already, I was already working with one or two freelance conservators in this tiny space in the bedroom um, when, when I decided enough was enough and got, got a studio space. And I think the minute I got a studio space, um, I couldn't really afford to not work with other people because I had to generate more income. I must say that I've yeah. never made more money than when I work from home. I mean, I, I used to make a really good living then compared with now. Um, <laughs> so there's something to be said from working from home because, you know, you don't have the overheads um, yeah. and, and you, yeah, you just with yourself, basically. So yeah. it, it, I, I kind of feel like my studio as a whole has just been like a, an evolving accident in a way there's not much planning involved I mean there's an enormous amount of planning involved but there's not I was going to say I'm sure there is <laughs> there has but but not but not in a kind of um not initially in a in a in a space and a, and a kind of thinking about how I wanted to work way mm. when you when you both first started did you feel the need for specific business training in any way I I think I didn't even think about it. I've just always, I, I, I realise now I should have had more business training and it's something I'm trying to address now, actually. I struggle now with the business side more than ever. Um, I didn't, it didn't occur to me at the time. Um, I just thought, oh, I suppose it's because I worked, started working from home and it was relatively easy, but also because actually, because I trained in a freelance, you know, in your business where I, I knew pretty well how, how to run a business from that experience. Um, right. So I wasn't that worried about it actually. Mm. So things like timesheets and... Um... I've all, yeah, I've always done that. <laughs> I, I always carried on, I, you know, having been trained like that by you, um, I always worked in that way in the museum. I used to, I didn't have a problem with recording my time. And I, I think that I, I think that's one of the most important things. And I mean, obviously it's really crucial when you're in a team yeah uh, but but actually thinking about it when you work on your own completely I think possibly I used to think more in terms of what was an acceptable amount of money for achieving a project you know mm -hmm. rather rather than having to achieve keep within my estimate and achieve a certain hourly rate which I do now yes that's an interesting point and Sarah what what what's your view on that Yes, I think because I think I work in that way, I kind of at the moment, I, I tend to think of what I find would be an acceptable amount. And uh, um, but it, it does kind of depend on on the job uh, that you're doing to a certain extent, you know, larger projects that might go on for, uh, you know, a few weeks, you know, you do definitely do need to keep within a certain estimate. And yeah. uh, um, yeah, in terms of business, I, I mean, I'm, we're very similar in that sense, Zenzi. I didn't really think too much about what it would be actually like running a business. I mean, I actually have a business studies A-level, which at the time when I chose that A-level, everyone looked at me a bit funnily because it, was, it, it wasn't very uh, uh, congruent with all my other ones, but actually it's turned out to be quite useful. So I had a mm. kind of basic mm. idea of, you know, what it would take to kind of run something small and then perhaps you know expand possibly in the future but I think why where it is such a, a kind of challenge is that it is a constantly evolving thing and yeah. it's sort of a little difficult to plan ahead in one way because you never really know what kind of projects are coming up uh, or, or yeah or you know the the types of things you might get so i'm what i it's quite interesting isn't it Zenzi? so i have a very small space as you can see and i don't 
have any kind of tapestry frames or anything like that. I just physically can't fit it in. But I wonder if you, if the sort of the the cart follows the horse or the other way around, you know, if you have a bigger space and you are able to do the sort of bigger projects and you get kind of known for being able to do that, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I, I would find it very, very difficult to downsize. And actually, you know, last year when we so nearly had to pack up and, I mean, the thing that actually kept me going was, well, apart from, I mean, was keeping my team together and keeping my studio together. But the horror in my mind was the thought of having to actually get rid of the equipment and pack it all up. And how would you do that? <laughs> so I think we, I just get bigger because I don't know how to get smaller, if that makes sense. You know, <laughs> I mean, we've actually taken on another space this year because we need more space. Um, but that, but again, that is responding to the projects that we've we've been offered. Yes, yes. So you've both survived the pandemic, it seems. And yeah. is there anything extra that you did during the pandemic that maybe like extra advertising, use of social media, looking for grants, reducing overhead overheads and staff, offering alternative services, and and all of those things. <laughs> 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 I think um, I think to survive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's been it's been horrific, but it's also been a really, really positive challenge. I think we've really stretched ourselves and we've risen to meet those challenges, and we've really had to think out of the box. Um, and we've we've taken advantage of of everything that was on offer. I mean, we did um, furlough the team, um, oh. and we um, sadly had to lose one or two people. And I haven't been able to use my normal freelance team. Um, and you know, a year or so later, obviously, um, some of them are no longer available. So you know, that's the very sad side. The, mm -hmm. the team is the most important thing, really. Um, but we're building the team back up at the moment. Um, yeah, we've we've had to think about diversifying. Um, we were, you know, right at the beginning of the pandemic when we thought when we lost all our. I mean, literally, we lost so much work, um, and you know, we were stuck at home. I was thinking, what else can I do with the space? I was thinking about making jam and marmalade in my lab. I mean, because, you know, that's something well, I did, I, I, I did notice doing. you were doing quite a lot of cooking. <laughs> I went slightly mad, I think, at home. But I also, I did, that was when I really got into Instagramming and social media a bit more, which I'd always been a bit um, kind of poo-pooed a bit before. But actually, emotionally, it was a really important lifeline for me the first month or two when we were at home, because it was just a way of... Um, communicating and kind of saying I'm a conservator <laughs> yes and I'm still here yes. Sarah, Sarah did, you, did you use um social media more do you think than you um I think that's something that I need to work on uh because I'm very sporadic because it's just me and so everything that I produce is just me and I think Zenzi does it actually really well I really she's very regularly posting and I think that's probably the way to to kind of gain more followers and get awareness of your business so I fully admire you for, for getting that right Zinzi um I, so I think for me I, I I find it a little bit difficult sometimes because I have clients who don't want to have their projects on uh on yes being that's advertised yeah and, good point. Uh, often they're the most exciting ones that I want to share um but you know you have to yeah, so that, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a privacy thing. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think I kind of struggle a little bit with content, but it's not something that I worry particularly about because that's just sort of one aspect. very small thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's nice to have, and um, I think if you kind of post semi regularly, I think that that's sort of all right. I don't know if you get any clients, Enzi, from from social media at all yeah we do actually that's been the surprising thing I mean I I didn't think it worked like that um but I I don't really do it for that reason I, I do it to communicate conservation because I really enjoy doing that and I think it I think in a roundabout way it is good for business and yes we have got we've definitely got jobs um because of it I mean I do get people saying that they've 
come to us because they've seen our social media. Yeah. Um, but I don't necessarily do it for that reason. Yeah, um, yeah I, I've always enjoyed talking about our work and I, I really love it when people come and look around the studio and it's all kind of grown out of that and that's why we've been developing our workshop side as well it's I just I it's kind of the biggest pleasure actually is is having people come and look around the studio and look at the objects and talk about the objects and you see them getting so kind of engaged and hooked into conservation I just love that yeah, yeah yeah I agree I, I think that's the best the best part really is uh, yeah is seeing seeing people's reactions to your work and what you do and and you get that on social media for sure yeah, yeah. and how, how 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 successful do you think your websites are in terms of attracting work um i uh, i think that i think they're a useful tool i think we w one of the things I did during lockdown was take on a new administrator who I fa had found. I've been spending the whole of my career looking for the perfect administrator, I think, for our business and found, found her just before lockdown and, um, and decided to still go ahead with that. So, so Jerry started with us in the middle of lockdown when we were still stuck at home and we built the website and that's what we did. Um, and it has i i think it i think it's important more as a reference point again i don't really know how much work we get from it mm. but it, i think it is a good reference point for people yeah it's almost like your kind of portfolio in a way if they're sort yeah. of looking for someone they immediately know who you are you, they can see that you're the real deal and then it, it sort of adds to your appeal i suppose yeah. Um, so I find that I get a few inquiries through the, the website again, because it's just me. I'm afraid I haven't, <laughs> I don't often have the time to update it. So I'm very slack on all of this, but um, one day I will. <laughs> um, Can't afford a, an administrator at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a question um, uh, that's come in. Um, so do you need to consciously tailor the size and type of work for a smaller space and if so how do you turn things down when you need the work or find different options options to take it on so if, if somebody's offering you something that is you can't accommodate in your space mm. um but you need the work how is there a way of trying to deal with that do you how or are there options to to choose from? Um, I think for me, because I sort of set myself up as a fashion conservation studio, although I do do textiles, it's not completely all fashion. I tend to get the sort of smaller projects that, or, you know, the biggest thing I would have would be a dress that I can fit on a table. But occasionally I do get kind of tapestries and, you know, larger things. And I just have to, you know, be very, the, the client has to be kind of open to me po possibly going and working in situ more yeah. if they can provide that. Um, but my living room did get a bit full. <laughs> At one point <laughs> I had a huge roller that just fitted in uh, my living room. It's not very big um, at one point. So I, if I have nothing else, I can always move furniture. And now I've got a slightly bigger space. It's as you can see from the photo there, it's a little more open plan. So in theory, I could fit bigger things in there now. Yeah. Um, so, or, you know, if it's something that I really can't accommodate, I'm, I keep going back to tapestries because it's an easy example, but you know, I just can't do it. And uh, you know, Cassini and Zenzi that, you know, tapestry conservation takes a long time and you need a lot of people on it for it to be any sort of efficient way of earning money. So yeah. for me, I would kind of pass it on to someone else. Um, and that's a kind of conscious choice for me. Um, and okay. I'm quite happy with that decision. Um, well, there, there's always been a bit of competition amongst freelance conservators who are often asked to tender for work. Um, and often tendering process is unpaid uh, and this has now become part of the norm. So what experience have you both had of the tendering process and 
has it affected the way you go about providing estimates and quotations? Um, well, we yeah, we've we've done lots the of big size ends. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I didn't really, ch I can't remember how many tenders that we've done and what proportion of them we've been successful. It's not very high. You do a lot of tenders and you don't get them. Um, and yeah, it is a big sigh because it's a huge effort. And I, I'm, I don't know whether it's just me, but I get very emotionally involved in objects and I get very emotionally involved right from the beginning in the kind of tender process. I put my whole heart and soul into it. And um, they take a lot of time and emotional effort and, and um, you're not very often successful. Um, I, I, don't, I do feel that there's probably more competition and a sort of sense of competing with one's colleagues at the moment, just because there's not a lot of work around. Um, I didn't used to feel that particularly, because I think that up until now there, there was a sort of certain amount of work and there were a certain number of studios and it and it used to get it seemed to me that it got shared around quite well um yeah I mean it's just it's one of those things we, we are working commercially so yes we are in competition with each other yes yeah it's a small profession yeah it is and I think I think I think because it's a small profession you have to be professional about it and you know, we all accept that we win some and we lose some and, and you know, often we'll go for projects and end up sharing the tent, you know, if it's a set of tapestries, you often end up working with another two or three studios to get the work done. So, I mean, everybody works pretty well together. Yeah. Have you found that, Sarah? Do you, yes, do I mean... My, uh, my only experience of tenders have been actually during COVID, so I think it's a little skewed. And actually, it's not, it hasn't been me just by myself. I've been part of a team, say, applying for an HLF uh, funding uh, sort of situation. So um, I, I, the, the last one I did, I had to uh, estimate for some banners from one photograph. <laughs> oh. That's all I had because it was COVID. No one could travel. Oh. No one could go into the the, the place and, and photograph them even more so I had no real idea what the size was or anything I, it was a pure guesswork um, and we actually so that was part of a bigger kind of project with lots of other different conservators so um, I feel my part of it wasn't quite as pressured as it would be if it was just myself mm. um, we happen to have won that tender so I'm hoping that my <laughs> estimates from one very blurry <laughs> photograph and we'll see um so yes i don't really have much experience with tenders and i think probably the sort of projects that require tenders maybe are aimed at more of a big a larger studio with more people so right. it's not really something i tend to to do much right um we have another question come in at the q a do you think being based in and near to London has helped build clients? Do you think it's an advantage rather than um, being in Yorkshire, for example, or <laughs> I don't know. This is just somebody who's in a... I don't think I, don't think I can answer that because I've always <laughs> been based near to London. And so obviously, you know, we work, we do work all over the country, but our work is quite sort of London and south of England based. Mm. Um, I mean, uh, to me, it's important to be close to London because it means I've got access to other conservators and I'm very close to the station, which is handy for my staff and for my clients. Um, Good point. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I mean, I think it if I could have afforded to still be in London, I would be, I think, because that's probably the... A pretty good spot to be but we've always found a lot of work so yeah and you Sarah you're, you're um, yes yeah, so I was just so. sort of thinking about my range of clients I think a lot of them are um, London based but then I do things for people internationally as well as all over the country so um, I like the kind of flexibility that London offers I mean it's very easy just to get on a train and go almost to the other end of the country and you can do that in a a day or so if you yes um, yeah. very handy so I guess there are kind of 
definite pros to being in London. You know, I'm flexible enough to, to go to the auction houses. If someone wants me to look at something, I can do that at very short notice. So I think in terms of just being a little bit more flexible for clients, it helps. Mm. Um, but I wouldn't say necessarily it's the be all and end all, um, simply because I have clients all over yeah. the UK. And you happen to be where you are. So yeah. you develop your business as it, as it, way in the region you are in don't you yeah. yes um uh, I, we have another uh, question does the size of your studio of business affect the type or amount of insurance yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and the value of the objects that you have in the studio yeah. um yeah, we've got a mega insurance <laughs> bill at the moment. Um, yeah, obviously it does. Mm. So your your hourly rates obviously have to cover overheads, and that's well, one of the well they do. But I, I that's one of the difficulties, really. I, I feel that we're it's really hard to put your hourly rate up, and that's why I'm, I was saying at the beginning, jokingly, but it was actually true that I used to make more money working from home personally than I do now mm. um, because that the profit margin is minute um, mm. especially in my situation with a really big um, studio yeah you know, our, our rent is ginormous our business rates are ginormous and um, we can't you know yes we can do big projects because we've got a big space and uh, but you know big projects are actually sometimes they're quite hard to make money on you know it's really you know the bigger your yeah. object the harder it is to get your estimate right yeah. um in in yeah. in some ways so um i think i think if you're a conservator to make money i would advise staying as small as possible <laughs> <laughs> oh, but we but we as as freelance conservators our insurance tends to be governed a bit by one company and, and the committee yeah. the textile committee have been looking into various um insurance providers to see what what you know what's out yeah. there and it, at the moment it keeps coming back to that one provider his cox for example uh gallagher's and uh so it's it's a difficult uh, it, is, it is difficult because it's it's highly highly specialized um, insurance I mean I, I've got a friend who's an insurance broker and um he he couldn't suggest any, anyone else um, yeah. but, you know on the other hand they are very experienced at our type of insurance and um yes indeed that's yeah. and I, I mean I've never had up until last year we'd never had call to use our insurance and I must say they were very very wonderful with us when we needed them last year so <laughs> Great. Yeah, That's I always I find them, although they are a little difficult to get in contact with sometimes, I do find them very helpful in terms of if you need to alter anything. So if I have a client who has something that is more kind of fine art based and therefore has a much higher value than usual kind of textiles, um, I have been able to kind of alter my liability uh, mm -hmm. kind of temporarily in order to cover me for a, a particular job. But I do um, kind of the, the more things that you have in the studio, obviously you have to keep an eye on that kind of level of, of value. Um, yeah. And that can be a little tricky sometimes, but um, yeah. I find it quite useful. And just for as a sort of sole trader I find them quite a reasonable rate for me at the moment so um, that's yeah. good so um, do you use specific terms and conditions when you estimate a quote for work an estimate and a quote being two different things of course or are you bound more by the client's contract and have you found um, on the icon website offers a questionnaire for terms and for for conservators to put together their own terms and conditions um, and that questionnaire um, can be quite helpful as a baseline to forming terms and conditions i mean how how have you how have you managed to um, deal with client expectations for example 
I think by com- trying to communicate really well with the client. I mean, I, I we 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 don't always give out terms and conditions. If I'm honest, I mean, we do sometimes. Often, uh, so to answer the question, often we are. Um, often it's the client is dictating all of that. If they're a big client, they have their own terms and conditions. And so they're not going to sign your contract, particularly your kind of almost, you're signing the, their contract. And I do find that with big clients um, and big projects. Um, I, I, I have still been using the terms and conditions that you used to be able to get from ICOM. Um, and it was you, Cassini, who drew my attention to this, the, the fact that they're not on their website anymore and they've got this new thing up. I hadn't, I hadn't noticed that. Mm. Um, and, but I, I sort of put some of my own s- just simple terms always at the bottom of our estimates, um, you know, about the acceptance must be made in writing and you have it in, ri- in writing when you're going to deliver the job and all that sort of thing. So I think the key is communicating with your client and it yeah. does depend on the client. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree with the communication. So I, I tend to always send my terms and conditions uh, w- along with my estimate uh, so that I'm completely covered. I'm not entirely sure who actually reads it, <laughs> if anyone, but at least it's sort of there and sent. Um, mm. And I think it's, um, it's so important. I always will kind of, in a way, repeat the estimate in my email back to them so it's really very clear uh, and then sort of it's an ongoing process sometimes of, of kind of uh, updating and negotiating if you need to change anything and and that sort of aspect of it so mm-hmm. I think it's maybe kind of easier for a sole trader like me to do that where where I have kind of only a couple of projects on the go at once I don't know mm-hmm. if you have kind of more um yeah in actual fact it's kind of interesting that the estimate question has come up when the slide you can see <laughs> so this was oh. my project which is the the heavily beaded dress on the on the left there which i again had only estimated for from a photograph because it happened to be from canada and uh, the the owner wanted an estimate before he sent it uh, and I completely got it wrong because it was it was just completely so fine, uh, and I ended up checking over about six hundred thousand beads, which I hadn't expected to do. So oh, gosh. <laughs> that was another kind. Of, luckily, he was very nice about it. But um, yeah, that was another kind of. It was just all about the communication. So if I had just received the object and then done the work and then gone back to him and said, actually, it, it took me this long and this much, I think he would that's not a great way of building a relationship. So I kind of, I tend to always um, update a client halfway through a project if I can, just to tell them on how I'm going and how yes, how it's looking. I find that that's really helpful. and People are always really interested to know. But I think that is very important. Yeah. And, um, and how many clients do you think when you give an estimate, do they actually think this is a quotation? I think there's sometimes some misunderstandings when, when you know, you say this is an estimate. It may go down or it may go up. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time they go up. <laughs> but, um, and have you ever found that? I mean, you've just talked about this dress and obviously... Mm. Um, you know, you you gave an estimate, not a quotation. So uh, I think there can be misunderstanding sometimes um, with those with that. So com- as you say, communication is yeah. is very important. Yeah. And if we go on to the next slide, let's see if I, Elizabeth Ann is in charge of the next slide. I've forgotten. Oh yes, I I rather liked this. Um, the 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 difference between the um, the purple gown and the Westminster Abbey um, change of scale there. I thought those were rather nice um, juxtaposition, um, and both are very different projects, um, but actually very similar at the same time. Um, the whole thing about getting right shapes and mounting. 
um, things right. Um, I oh, I've just noticed some more questions. Sorry, I'm going to just have a look. Um, here we are. Oh, could you expand on the topic of timekeeping and how it reflects on cost estimates? I'm finding correct pricing the trickiest aspect of all. This is from an anonymous attendee. Do you want me to say that again? No. <laughs> um, I think I think getting it right is really down to experience. But even even if you're not that experienced, it's really important to know how long it takes you as a conservator to do things. Um, and I, I, I've just spent some of the afternoon watching the CTC um, students giving their presentations about their placements and they, they're all very conscious of time, you know, right through that course. I think that's really good that they, 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 they do an estimate of how long they think it's going to take, even though they're just students working on something and they've never done it before. And then they compare the hours afterwards. And I think that's what we all have to do. I mean, that's what we do. We still do that. We, we do estimates. We keep very careful timesheets and then we look at them at the end. And yeah, often they've gone over and we need to know why they've gone over. Yeah. And it's just life. I mean, that's conservation. You can't predict it exactly. Um, and, I, you know, I don't very often go back to a client for more money um, unless it's been... Um, you know an evolving situation we've all had those with objects and then obviously communication is really important mm. um and we i think we i think where we lose i think where i find it hard to get the timing right is is the whole kind of team aspect thing because the bigger your team the more time you waste in a sense because there's just more discussion going on um and and again you know Sarah probably doesn't have that so much now or yet, <laughs> mostly working on her own. But, you know, it's it's entirely different in my situation where um, I may be doing the, the estimate on behalf of the whole studio and then having to make sure we stick to it. It, it, it is a challenge, but it's 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 something that you get better at with experience, I would say. Yes, I think, and so. I think it, Est you know, estimating for other people is always very difficult because you know how fast you can stitch, I don't know, a metre of herringbone and someone else might be longer or shorter than that. So I think, I wonder, Zinzi, if is, is it difficult to kind of take into account the kind of different speeds of people in the studio, in your studio? I'm just very well, strict to make them all okay. do it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, obviously it is. Yeah, I mean, but you... you uh, you get to know your team. I mean, yeah. we have, um, uh, for me, the team's incredibly important and nurturing the team and keeping the team together. And, and part of that is, is knowing how they all work and what they are particularly good at and what they're not so good at. And sometimes when your back's against the wall and something has to be done super quick, you'll pick one person over the other. It's, it's not, you know. Mm. At, at the National Trust Studio, in order to help with estimating, um, we developed um, a file mm. where basic procedures were timed. So uh, we knew that um, a meter of Velcro, for example, mm. would take something like one and a half hours to prepare or so we so work on. in a similar way as well. Yeah, so, so, and you know, the preparation of linings, depending on the fabric and the size of, of a, say, a tapestry lining, you know, you, you would work out the, the um, approximate time for, for that pr procedure. So there are some basic procedures that you can... But that um, only gets you so far, doesn't it? Because um, it only gets you so far. But <laughs> the individual object, and um, yeah, that's what's yeah, it does. But it, it is helpful, though. Yeah. It is helpful. Um, yeah, I, would, I kind of wish that the wish there was a, um, a sort of secret formula for it, but, yeah. it, it, <laughs> but there just isn't. It, and I think it is something that you you're constantly learning, and you constantly kind of every time you do a project, you know, it goes in your head you know well this took me this long and if I do something similar you can kind of refer back to it so 
Yes, yeah. Um, we have another question. Do you find Icons Conservation Register helpful for your business? And if not, what could it do to improve? Do you have any ideas on that? Um, well, we've only recently gone on it for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't on it before. Um, we went on it after it was rejigged and that that it's quite expensive for a studio of our size and we've you know put quite a bit of effort into putting lots of projects on and I'm not sure if it's getting us any business. I, I have I think yes I think we've got one or two jobs through it and I have referred people to it actually. Um, I had a new client just this week um, and I, I said, I said, oh, if you want to have a look at a range of our work, you know, look on the icon website. <laughs> um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I've, I've heard through the grapevine from other private conservators that they don't necessarily get that much work or they get inquiries, but then the inquiries don't turn into jobs, which was why I didn't ever go on it before, because we didn't need to, because we always had enough work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. I'd always heard those that sort of rumours too, and I and at the I haven't only, I've only been on it since it got rejigged as well. So mm -hmm. I think I'm only a name and accredited on it. I'm not any. I haven't got a kind of standout profile in any way, and I I also think it's not. I have not really found it particularly helpful. I don't think I've got had any inquiries through through it. Um, I think. I mean, I think we've had some inquiries since we went on I mean obviously I don't know from before because we went on it but um I think probably I I think you need to have a profile up there to yeah. be noticed yes and as, as you say the more it's so expensive though it's expensive because and the price increases doesn't it depending on how many people you employ yeah. um, but even for a sole person it's still quite expensive so I've that's an expense I've chosen not to have at the moment and do you think ICON could <clears throat> make it more publicly known in some way through and if so through what sort of medium? Yeah I mean the whole the just the fact that it's called the conservation register I mean that is quite a tongue twister and it's a long thing to put in a search in a in a search engine so I wonder if the name could be changed. Um, well, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. And I often might... I think often I think people who are looking for our sort of services don't really know what it's called. Yeah, I so agree. So they might <laughs> kind of say think it's restoration, in which case they'll type in restoration to Google and then nothing about conservation will come up. So maybe that's that's an issue as well. Yes, and a lot of people may not know what icon is either. Yeah. So that's a difficulty. Yeah. Um so can you offer any tips for getting work when first starting out in private practice? This is another question. <laughs> we could go on all night here, but I know time is time is running away with us now. But uh, so uh, there's just a few more questions here. Can you offer any tips? I would say talk to anyone and everyone who will listen because you never know <laughs> who everyone knows. I mean, it's it can be so random. I found, you know, I went away for on a surfing weekend, and one of the girl, other girls on the weekend, happened to work in heritage, and now I've actually got some work through her. So, it, you know, anyone who listen, I'll talk. And actually, it's not a it's not a particularly difficult thing to talk about because people are really interested in what you do, anyway. So it's a kind of a a fairly easy thing to talk about with other people I find anyway. <laughs> yeah I agree I, I mean I think um, I think communicating about conservation is the way so so uh, um, we recently had a job come into the studio that was a direct result I say direct uh, from about 15 years ago when I did a, a roadshow about conservation and um, apparently talked to this man I don't remember because it was a long time ago and I was talking to hundreds of people that day but he took my card and um remembered um and came in with a project all these years later so I think you know those doing those kind of publicity events and 
I, I think you know they're never they're never worth it economically. You rarely get paid for doing them, but it's good communication. It's mm. good PR, um, mm. and, and 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 it's surprising how often you get referred when you've met people that way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like just as conservation is a small world, you know, the the world of textiles and and collecting and that sort of thing mm. is also very small so I always see anyone I talk to as an opportunity not that I'm sort of hawking for work you know I, I just kind of <laughs> communicate a kind of uh, uh, enthusiasm I think and people mm. respond yes pe people mm. respond I think to your enthusiasm and passion for something don't they yeah absolutely what has been particularly valuable then in helping you through your career as a as, as a freelance conservator? Mm. Oh, food for thought there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, one's contacts and and I think it's I think it's I think it's this communication thing again. I think um it's just just being open and and uh talking about conservation and then you know keeping in touch with people I think when I first started out I was very unconfident that anyone would want to give me any work and I was quite reticent about asking advice from curators you know come having worked in a museum for 10 years or so I, I was quite insecure about not having curators to ask advice of and I, I didn't used to ask their advice. I thought they would be too busy. But actually, I ask all the time now. And um, people are really generous with their time. And I'm generous with my time. And I, th yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's important. Sorry, I've forgotten what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> what has been particularly valuable in helping you through your career? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think it's other people's generosity with their, with their knowledge and with their projects and um with their professional friendships actually yeah yeah i agree i agree and you sarah yeah i completely agree, agree with, with that. that yeah yeah and um what is the main piece of advice you give to those who are thinking of or who have recently begun a career as a freelance conservator what would be your main piece of advice not don't do it <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah you go oh, first Desi. okay I I would say um it's tough it's hard work but I think ultimately it's incredibly rewarding and I think you just have to be perseverant persevering and just I think see it as a kind of marathon it's not a sprint you know you have to take time to build up uh, your name and so you get known in the in for, with clients uh so yeah i think i think that mm, i i mean i agree with that um i think i think one bit of advice that i would give to emerging conservators is get some experience first <laughs> i i really worry about people who set up very soon after training i think that's bad for them and it's bad for the profession so um I know some people don't have any choice but um I think get get some experience and then if it's what you want to do go for it but my advice then would be probably to stay quite small um because you know I I wouldn't change anything now you know we've got a fantastic team and a fantastic studio and we have brilliant projects but it's incredibly stressful running a big conservation business the the profit margins are low and if my business is like a beast that has to be fed work at all times you know I'm always you know looking for the next project and trying to secure the next project while the current ones are going on otherwise we're going to go bust and it is really stressful um and I didn't I don't think I anticipated how stressful it would be um and so it, yeah it's also not something that you can switch off like you're always no. thinking no. about it yeah you yeah. know you you work almost more well, you do work more than if you were employed by someone else. That's just the yeah. fact. Of, that's any sort of business, I think. You wake up in the middle of the night worrying about things. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, um, I, I think also you need to like people because um, we we talked a lot about 
the importance of communication. And if, if you want to have a successful business, you do need to be able to um, communicate. So if, if you're a real loner and you just like completely working on your own, I think you will find it quite hard to get work. Um, I think you do need to get out there and, and communicate and make good contacts to get work. But I would, I would stay small if I was you or those people out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we, we have to come to our last question now. Um, is Would you both describe for us a particularly satisfying moment in your career? For example, are there certain treatments, accomplishments, discoveries in which you take particular pride? And what has been most challenging? So go for the first one, the satisfying moment. <laughs> no <laughs> I think, well I think for me because I'm sort of, sort of still kind of new to this sort of life I think just the fact that I had the courage of my convictions and left uh, a full-time job I mean that was utterly terrifying I, I'd admit that and uh, but I don't regret it at all so I think for me my my answer to that that question kind of in, encompasses all of those aspects so i'm just i'm i'm kind of proud of my confidence that i just went for it and i don't regret it and i think had i not done it i might have regretted it so yeah. i think my um best moments are just the enormous pride i always feel at the end of projects so I just am um, beside myself with pride about what my team achieve um and I, I yeah I think so I mean I, I I was very proud of our effigies project it was incredibly complex um I've been really proud of the complicated treatments we've done um at Knoll on the on lots of wall hangings I mean that photo <laughs> that's up now is is the the Cafoy which I don't know can't even remember how many hundreds of meters of that we cleaned but also you know managed to um remove it from uh, from the top of the wall without it falling down the wall remove it so that the archaeology could be done behind um by coming up with a very clever way of doing it that you know everyone thought was wouldn't work you know I, I love I love um working out complicated treatments and then achieving them with the team and it's all about the team that's that's where I'm most proud problem solving and the team yeah yeah excellent well thank you both very much indeed um it's been great hearing you uh, and you. talking to you Thank you very much. And thank you for sharing some of your images here, which you sent in. And um, yeah, um, so we have there, there, we had a few more questions in the Q&A, but I think we've answered most of them. And so I will now hand back to Elizabeth Ann and see where we are. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to unmute myself there. So, um, yeah, we will. I'm just trying to get everybody up at the same time. Gallery. I can, I just, just, can I just ask say one thing? Yeah. I can just say one thing, actually. I have this book that was recommended to me by another conservator who runs a consultancy business, and I find found it really useful. Um, it's called Little Me Big Business. Oh, where's the camera? Oh, yes. And... Um, it, there's a lot of kind of examples. Down. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of examples in it about kind of um, sort of thinking a bit bigger. And there's one particular chapter that I read quite a lot, which is pr about pricing and how to value your time, uh, which I kind of reread every so often just to kind of remind me. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of aimed a lot more at kind of women in business uh but it is quite it's quite useful uh just to have a quick read thank you for that thank you for that and we've had some nice um uh do the comments get kept because i i'd be really interested to read them and the, and the questions yes, uh, elizabeth, elizabeth Ann, where are you 
Um, I am here. I'm just sorry. I'll come. I'll come. Yes, right. we, we can keep the comments. Yeah. Um, and in the chat, there's um, some nice things in the chat. Somebody's left a um, link to something about insurance. Um, there's um, uh, somebody said, thank you both for your honesty and your generosity this evening. All very useful for me. Loads of experience, but not as a freelancer. Thank you both. That was very interesting. An interesting hour. And French, thank you all. Great sharing of experiences. Um, many thanks for this very helpful webinar. Thank you. It's always useful to know how others work and set up their business. Thank you all very much. That was a fascinating discussion. Really interesting and entertaining. <laughs> um, Nikki Yates, that was. And Jennifer Cruz, thanks to everyone. Very useful. And thank you. This has been very useful. So a very positive response. So thank you both very much indeed and um before you you everyone goes uh just to remind people that on the 18th of october we have another zoom event um called fibers back to basics the science of fibers accessible to all and um uh chris forster i think is uh going to um, present his PhD research work for us and um, on the 18th of November um, at seven o'clock we have Emma Slocum uh, giving a talk on identity and politics in the needlework of Mary Queen of Scots and this it coincides with the exhibition at the British Library um, uh, called Elizabeth and Mary Royal Cousins Rival Queens which opens on the 8th of October. So those two events will be uh, see our spring lecture series if you like, um, that will be the end of the lecture series and then the committee will be planning next year's events in due course. So um, I think Elizabeth Ann I think we've we've done I think you, you yes. <laughs> so <laughs> this meeting, on pages. <laughs> yes, this meeting is going to close and um, I'm going to close this one and then I'll open up the needle and thread so everybody can come on and chat and ask questions in person. OK, yeah, uh, and Thank hopefully you. we'll have the technology right for the next one. This is our first blip, I have to say, in all these Zooms. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Well Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.